Hello, this is Dr. Pat Santucci, Medical Director of ANID, and I would like to welcome you to ANID's educational series that's meant for any individual concerned about eating disorders. The topic for today is orthorexia nervosa, when healthy eating turns dangerous. Part one will be recognizing what orthorexia nervosa is, and part two will be some tips for recovery. Well, for many of us, healthy eating is not a bad thing. However, when the desire to be healthy actually turns into an obsession, then maybe it's time to be concerned. I'd like to share a story uh, from Jordan Younger about her experience with learning about this new disorder. Jordan, who actually is the author of Breakin' Vegan, talks about how trying to be her healthiest actually led her to orthorexia. She was known previously as a blonde vegan when she preached whole foods, no grains, fats, sugars, and certainly a plant-based diet that didn't include any animal products. Jordan, in her previous experiences, had food sensitivities and found herself with allergies, nausea, pain, and bloating, and actually had hoped that it would be a cure-all for all of her digestive problems. Jordan became fixated on righteous eating for health purposes, and Jordan went raw, refusing to eat anything that was heated over a certain temperature or wasn't 100% clean. She started cycles of detox by placing herself on cleansings, followed by the reintroduction of greens, veggies, fruits, and nuts, and then returning to cleansings. Jordan attempted to hide her food phobias from friends. She avoided social meals by claiming it was too hard to eat out as a vegan. Her goal to restrict solid foods became more and more difficult, especially when hunger would strike. Eventually, she would break down, consume solid foods, and experience an overwhelming feeling of guilt and anxiety. And this only led her to rededicate herself once again to another cycle of cleansing. Jordan's weight dropped over 15 pounds and she experienced a loss of energy, lost her periods, thinning hair, her skin was tinted orange from too much beta carotene and she had difficulty sleeping. She was filled with anxiety, obsessing about what was she going to eat the next day and what foods did she need to avoid. After talking with a friend who was recovering from an eating disorder, Jordan recognized that she had a problem, but she didn't know what it was called. As it turned out, it did have a name. It was called orthorexia. If Jordan's story sounds like you or a friend, then you might be interested in going on and looking at the rest of this presentation. Let's start by doing some sort of self-assessment test. This one is called the Bratman Orthorexia Self-Test and it's composed of six questions. If you answer yes, then you might have reason to be concerned. Take the test for orthorexia. So if you are a healthy diet enthusiast, you might want to take this test. Number one, do you spend more than three hours a day thinking about food? That might include things like shopping, research, talking on, uh, to your friends about things, uh, preparing foods. Number two, do you plan tomorrow's food today? Number three, do you care more about the virtue of what you eat than the pleasure you receive from actually eating it? Number four, have you found that the quality of your diet has increased, but the quality of your life has decreased? Do you keep getting stricter with yourself? Do you sacrifice experiences that you once enjoyed to eat the food you believe is right? Do you feel an increased sense of self-esteem when you are eating healthy food? Do you feel a sense of guilt when you stray from your diet? Does your diet 
begin to actually socially isolate you. And when eating the way you're supposed to, do you feel a sense of peace or a sense of total control? Well, if you answered yes to more than four of these questions, you probably are obsessing over your healthy diet too much. If you answered yes to more of those, then you have an issue that is impacting your life. So if you'd like to go on, let's learn more about orthorexia. If you're a health diet enthusiast, you may want to take the following test. It's called the Bratman Orthorexia Self-Test. And it comes from Dr. Bratman in his book called Health Food Junkies. So the first question is, do you spend more than three hours a day thinking about food? Now that would include planning your meals, making your meals, shopping, uh, checking on the internet, talking with friends. So if it's more than three hours a day, say yes. Do you plan tomorrow's food today? Number three, do you care more about the virtue of what you eat, the quality of what you eat, more than the pleasure you receive from actually eating the food? Number four, have you found that the quality of your diet has increased and the quality of your life decreased? Number five, do your diets keep getting stricter and stricter and are you more stringent with yourself? Number six, do you sacrifice experiences you once enjoyed to eat food your belief is right? Number seven, do you feel an increased sense of self-esteem when you're eating healthy food? Number eight, do you feel guilt or self-loathing when you stray from your diet? Number nine, does your diet socially isolate you? And number 10, when eating the way you're supposed to, do you feel a peaceful sense of total control or superiority? Well, if you have answered yes to more than four questions, you probably are obsessing over your health, healthy diet way, way too much. And if you answered yes to all the questions, then you have an issue that is impacting your life. So if you want to learn more about orthorexia, go to the next slide. Okay, here's the first question on the self-test. I spend so much of my life thinking about choosing, preparing health food, that it begins to interfere with other parts of my life, such as love, creativity, family, friendship, school, or work. Question number two, so answer any part, yes or no. When I eat food I regard to be unhealthy, I feel anxious, guilty, or defiled. Being near such food disturbs me, and I feel judgmental of others who eat such food. Question number three, my personal sense of peace, happiness, joy, and self-esteem is dependent on the purity and the rightness of what I eat. Question number four. Sometimes I would like to relax my good food rules, but I can't. Now, if you have a medical condition which would make this unsafe, then this item doesn't really apply to you. Number five. Over time, I have steadily eliminated more foods in an attempt to maintain or enhance health benefits. And sometimes I will take an existing food theory or diet and I'll begin to add my own beliefs. And the final question, number six, my healthy eating has caused me to lose more weight than people say is good for me or has caused me some physical and emotional symptoms such as signs of malnutrition, loss of my periods, skin problems, hair loss, anxiety, etc. If you answered yes to any of the questions and want to know more, 
Please feel free to continue with the PowerPoint, both the audio and visual component. Part one is recognition, and part two are tips for recovery. And for any questions, comments, or concerns, please contact us at www.anid.org. So what is orthorexia? Well, orthorexia is an unhealthy obsession with healthy eating. This preoccupation can be all-consuming, taking up so much of your time, impairing your relationships, and even becoming dangerous to your physical and mental health. Now, it usually starts with good intentions, and perhaps you are becoming concerned about your own health issues, or you just want to take some preventative measures by doing the right thing and eating healthy. You may be concerned that your low energy or your low mood or anxiety or those digestive problems, asthma or allergies, might actually be linked to some kind of certain foods. Well, our society promotes health and thinness and influences our thinking. Media promotes the message, change your diet, change your life, and all good things should happen. So you make a decision to try to eat healthy and carefully avoid foods that you feel might be harmful. Now, that doesn't sound too dangerous, does it? Like many others, you probably will begin by avoiding one or all of the following foods. Sugar, fat, gluten, animal or dairy products, artificial additives or preservatives, pesticides, or genetically modified foods. Well, if you have a predisposition to orthorexia, you might have it also the kind of thinking that says, if avoiding one is good, maybe avoiding more is better. So if that list of avoidance foods begins to expand, that might be a signal that you should be concerned. Now that you've decided that you want to eat healthy, you begin to spend a lot of time thinking about, well, what are the healthy foods and how do I set up and maintain a healthy diet? You probably spend a lot of time on that internet, checking websites, gathering information, participating in chat rooms, checking out recipes. And from various sources, you hear that elimination of certain foods might actually promote health and even cure disease. While following the lead of others, you begin to shop the perimeter of the grocery store, check out the labels, and scan for nutritional values of food. In fact, you may be spending so much time researching and planning your meals that it begins to actually interfere with your normal and everyday pleasurable activities. So alert, if you're spending more than three hours a day cooking, shopping, reading about your diet, discussing or joining chat groups, you probably are spending too much time on the subject. All healthy diets healthy? Well, some healthy eating diets are literally more dangerous than others. But boys, it may be difficult to determine that, especially with social media and the hype put around that. Unfortunately, this kind of misinformation can lead to a lot of risky decisions. So, in general, keep this principle in mind. The more restrictive a diet, the greater the risk of developing orthorexia. Well, what do these different types of healthy diets promise? There are lots of beliefs out there, but generally it's about better health. It may be to improve your mood, your energy, your memory and mental function, and oftentimes it will solve those medical problems that you may be dealing with where you feel that uncomfortable GI sensation or you get allergies or whatever. But oftentimes when regular routine kind of med medicine doesn't work for you, you begin to search for alternatives. And these alternatives often take you down the path of the healthy eating. It also talks about disease prevention and reducing such as a risk of cancer or perhaps you're gluten sensitive and you want to reduce the risk of actually having a more difficult reaction to gluten. Um, but there's really no evidence that this does that.
There's also a phenomena of eat in a way that's friendly to environment. This really fits in our culture. Be righteous, be morally superior, do the right thing. Eat in a way that's friendly to the environment. It, if, it, if it has a mama or it doesn't grow out of the ground, oh, oh, it may not be friendly to that environment. But deeper, there are deeper issues. Control over your own personal destiny. How many times have you heard, this changed my life? This made a difference in my life. Boy, if we're struggling, we want to hear those things. And it's really important that, quote unquote, someone gives that to us. We hear what we want to hear. But there are other two other things now that are happening. Because healthy used to mean healthy foods and being pure and organic and et cetera. And weight loss was a different issue, but today the weight loss and healthy, low calorie are kind of coming together. And so not only do the healthy diets promise all of the above, but by golly, they promise weight loss. And we know as a society how significant thinness is to our society. And detox, get rid of those toxins, get rid of those bad things, okay, in our system. No evidence that this really, really works, but we assign kind of semi-magical superfoods like kale, kale's still a magical food, while we demonize other foods like gluten. So as a matter of interest, I decided to kind of currently list the popular healthy diets. Gluten-free, paleo, vegetarian, clean eating, 8-10-10, fruitism, raw food. Whatever the diet du jour is today, there will be another one tomorrow, okay? Um, that's just the way it seems to be going. So let's look at one of the more popular one, gluten-free. Well, everybody's doing it. Supermarkets, if you've been down there, the shelves are stocked with gluten-free products. Uh, raw food and vegan restaurants are popping up every month. The sales of gluten-free products have increased almost 63% from 2.12 to, through 2.14, and they're on the rise. But only 1% of the population has celiac disease, and only 6% of the population may actually be gluten-sensitive. So what's all this about gluten-free? Actually, the only way you can tell is if you do a screening. If you go to your physician and have a screening, you will, you will determine whether you have celiac disease okay, or gluten sensitivity. But this doesn't stop everyone because if we look at, at some of the actual research that came out, 86% of people who believe they were gluten sensitive could actually tolerate it without any negative side effects. What does that talk about marketing and suggestibility? Don't be a victim of, of marketing. And if we look at the information, sometimes it gets very conflicting and we're not sure exactly what to believe. For instance, Mayo Clinic says no research to support gluten-free diet for anyone unless affected by celiac disease. And actually, a gluten-free diet might be bad for your health because it tends to lower iron, calcium, fiber, folate, thiamine, riven, riboflavin, and niacin. But on the other side, a nutritionist from the American Dietary Dietetics Association says, well, it's possible to follow this diet if you follow standard dietary advice. So the question is, what's standard dietary advice? Do we really know what that is? And will people actually follow that? Okay, clean eating. Well, clean eating is really the buzzword for today. It's the club for those who are really in the know. Um, young people, 4 and 10 young people between ages 18 to 24 have tried this. And what it does is it embraces pure whole foods like vegetables and fruits and whole grains, plus 
healthy proteins and fats and cut back on additives and pa uh, pesticides, preservatives, large amount of sugar, chemically modified, GMO. Doesn't sound too bad. But in reality, the definition of clean eating is pretty vague for many people. They take it to where they want it to go. And sometimes we'll see that really this society determines what foods are unhealthy. And it can even go a step further. Refuse to eat if it's unclear about the preparation or what it contains. Or refuse if it's not prepared by themselves or prepared in such a way that it isn't actually pure, let's say farm to table. So orthorexia can be a particular risk to dieters who become obsessive about clean eating. And also, individuals make up their own rules and their own definition, de definitions of what clean eating actually is. Okay, paleo, good or bad? Well, paleo, uh, promotes eating foods only as our ancestors did during the Paleolithic era, but high protein, high fiber. It's similar to clean eating, but prohibits all grains, not just re refined ones, legumes, dairy products, which clean eating does not. But there's still that elimination of entire food groups, and that what is becoming dangerous. Fruitarianism. This is the new age spiritual diet that has kind of social and a political statement attached to it. Uh, Apple came to Jobs during his fruitarian phase after visiting a apple farm. And this diet recommends fresh raw fruits, seeds, nuts. And you drink water only if and when you quote unquote cheat on your diet or you eat something other than fruit. And of course, there's the social and political statement of opposition to killing for food. Well, the health benefits, uh, quote unquote, live more than 100 years, are not really uh, uh, documented by research. And when we look at this diet, it's too high in sugar, too low in protein, insufficient in vitamins and calcium. And the rigid eating pattern one fruit at a time, only when you're hungry, then eat until you're full. We're seeing these diets become more and more rigid as we go down the list. Another new popular one is the 80-10-10, 80% raw fruit, 10% lean protein, raw plant-based, and 10% fat. Well, the pros are, of course, to eat a lot of produce, but you know, recent analysis says, hey, wait a second, we don't get much more benefit if we eat five, five servings, so we may not need to have all these 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 servings of, of produce a day. And the second pro is they don't eat processed food. Well, that's okay. Cons, high in sugar. Uh-oh. The need to eat constantly. Low in fat. And remember, some fat is good. Fat helps slow down the absorption of sugar. It keeps our insulin levels at a more even keel. And fat is important for our brain, our heart, and certainly enhances absorption of fat-soluble nutrients. But this diet also is low in protein. Popular uh, healthy eating diet is raw, going raw. These consist mostly of organic foods and raw fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, grains. Some will actually eat unpasteurized dairy food or raw eggs and raw meat or fish. Now food can be cold or even a bit warm as long as it doesn't go over 118 degrees. And the concept here is that the heat destroys nutrients and natural enzymes that boost the digestive uh, system and fight chronic illness. But again, there's so many varieties of what a rawest is and which variation you're going to use. And depending on the strictness of the diet, you can actually end up having some deficiencies, such as the vitamin B12 deficiency, which would lead to fatigue and balance problems, depression, poor memory. 
and um, lower your good cholesterol, which would mean an increase in risk for your heart attack. And particularly important, especially for women, is the fact of osteoporosis, poor bone density, lower weight, lower calcium and vitamin D. These are all issues that one needs to be aware of when you quote unquote go raw. And although um, it may be safe for a lot of people who abide by dietary standards, a lot of individuals will put their own spin on such diets. Well, honestly, as we go down the list, we can just see that some diets are just ridiculous. And I put this in just for fun, but there are really people who follow this or say they follow it, and it's called breathinarianism. We lose weight through the power of air and sun. Well, this is the mother of all restrictive diets. It contains no food at all. And you live off the life force of pure air and sunlight as the energy source. You can say, well, wait a second, how can you live without food? Well, the believers say so, but also the believers have been caught kind of cheating, carrying a hamburger, hot dog, french fries, and coke. Whoops, maybe that isn't quite really what they say. So what's important for you? Well, understand that these extreme elimination diets can take on religious fervor by the wellness gurus that endorse them. Usually there's not very much research, or if there is research, it's not good research. There's pseudoscientific theories, there's rigid rules. These are dangerous, damaging, and unfortunately completely socially acceptable. So why should you be concerned? Well, it's not saying that you know healthy eating diets are right or wrong. I think it's the concept that when they take a dietary theory, especially one that is not scientifically based, and they bring it to unhealthy extremes, being unable to see or accept the dangers of this type of diet, you know, we get blindsided so often. Somebody appears on TV, somebody writes a book, we take it for granted that this is actually the fact. The problem with these guys in a diet is that sometimes they take on a life of their own. Um, we insert our own beliefs with them, and there's almost that addictive component to them where we're not able to stop even if we want to. So we end up being controlled and trapped in the very opposite of what we wanted to have happen, and that's to be healthy and well. So what's the bottom line? Those that practice extreme restriction are 18 times more likely to develop an eating disorder. Think about that. So can this healthy eating actually become a gateway to orthorexia? Hmm. Many people diet, but not everyone develops an eating disorder. Many people focus on healthy eating in moderation and don't develop orthorexia. And some people are good in moderation, while others just are not. And some people are more vulnerable and carry a risk. And some diets are more restrictive and carry a greater risk. So, bottom line again, when balance and moderation are lost, either with the individual or the type of diet, you may be on a slippery slope to malnutrition, orthorexia, or even an eating disorder. Who is at risk for developing orthorexia? Actually, little research has been done on this subject, especially in North America. As a matter of fact, it's not even a diagnosis yet. It is still a concept, and we're not sure whether it should be included under eating disorders or under obsessive compulsive disorders, but all we know is that apparently the incidence of this group of symptoms is increasing. So, anyone who engages in extreme healthy dieting is probably at risk. Age, well, any age, but we're seeing kind of an increase in individuals between 20 and 30, both men and women, and all socioeconomic uh, levels. 
Someone who is excessively preoccupied with maintaining a healthy diet, maybe somebody in the healthcare field or in nutrition. Studies have been shown where medical students and, and dietitians seem to have an increase in quote unquote healthy eating concepts and developing orthorexia. Certainly athletes who uh, are on a quest for optimum health and usually people who are anxious about medical problems or fear that they have medical problems that are not addressed by traditional medicine such as allergies or skin problems or even emotional problems, mood and fatigue seem to be ex excessively preoccupied with that healthy diet. But underlying a lot of this is the concept of personality traits, the obsessive compulsive personality. That individual who's that perfectionist and who wants to do the right thing, who is driven to do, to do well, um, that individual seems to be most vulnerable. There's also parental influence, and I want to make a special statement here because a lot, what we're seeing is a lot younger kids uh, getting very, very preoccupied about good foods, bad foods, what they can eat, what they can't eat. And many of the parents, especially in that age group of, you know, 30, 35, are going into uh, different types of diets with the hope, again, of pre preventing illness. And the concept is dropping down to their children. But unexpectedly, I think what they're doing is a lot of times they're labeling foods good and bad. And they are actually creating a problem in that in some of these elimination diets that the children are not really getting nourished very well. The last group is a group of individuals who actually have had a history of an eating disorder or have an eating disorder. Um, again, so much of the concepts are very similar that uh, it's sometimes hard to differentiate. Is this an anorexia or bulimia or is this just a focus on eating healthy or what actually is happening. Well, what causes anorexia? Actually, we don't know. As a matter of fact, we don't know really what causes eating disorders either. Uh, we take a broad kind of view and understanding that these are serious biological illnesses, but they all have a biopsychosocial component to them. What we do know is that orthorexia has a close link to eating disorders. It also has a close link to anxiety disorders, particularly obsessive compulsive disorder, and even relationship to addiction. If you look at the patterns, it appears that one needs to do more and more and more of the dietary restrictions to get the same effect. Sounds somewhat like an addiction. What we do know is that there's strong personality traits that appear in orthorexia, and those are obsessive compulsive traits, that perfectionism driven personality. And food then becomes a primary source of happiness, self worth, and meaning. And the social component is there. After all, there is a lot of evangelizing by many people about the value of these diets. And some of it is poor information and unfortunately a lot of buy-in by, by professionals. And unfortunately even more so, a lot of false scam advertising. So not everyone that eats quote unquote healthy, all right, uh, or is on a healthy eating diet ends up with a disorder. So what makes that transition from diet to disorder? And there have been some criteria suggested. And the first one is, of course, that mental preoccupation and the very restrictive dietary practices that are geared toward one specific type of result to promote optimum health. Number two, these self-imposed dietary rules, when these are violated, the individual goes into emotional turmoil. Number three, escalation over time. More is needed to get the same effect, more restriction. Number four, malnutrition, weight loss, or other medical complications from the restricted diet. Number five, there has to be an impact on everyday functioning. There has to be 
some kind of emotional distress or impairment of everyday functioning. And number six, the identity and self-worth is dependent on the compliance with healthy eating. Just like with anorexia, anorexia is with the thinness. This is the compliance with healthy eating. Now, these are suggested criteria, okay? And they're not written in stone at this point, but it, at least it's a stepping stone to maybe making this, working toward a diagnosis. So when we're looking at signs, we always ask, what's the motivation, what's the goal? And the goal in orthorexia is health and healthy eating. And it's about the quality of the food, the purity, the healthness, the fitness, the virtuosity. And to reach that goal, one must avoid all foods that are seen as unhealthy, unclean, unwholesome, or even harmful. Now, although anorexia and orthorexia nervosa share a lot of common commonalities, the goals are different. An individual with orthorexia might say, I don't want to be thin. I want to be healthy, clean, and pure. Again, the fear is the quality of the food and to consume these foods, some harm is going to come to me. Whereas an individual with anorexia might say, I want to be thin and I'm afraid of gaining weight or becoming fat. So the fear there is the quantity of food, the calories, the kind of foods that might make me fat. But times are changing, okay, and the concept of thinness and healthy somehow are merging into one. And so we're seeing a lot of overlapping of orthorexia and anorexia. And sometimes the desire is for both to occur. Sometimes it's really, orthorexia is really a way of hiding the anorexia. Uh, so it takes a very good evaluation to determine what is really the goal, what is really the motivation that this person has for engaging in this kind of behavior. And so the question is, will orthorexia become a new healthy eating disorder? or will it become a subtype of anorexia? So let's take another look at a sign. What happens to my eating? And what we see is increased restrictions and decreased variety. Number one, the thoughts, the obsessions with food. Can I eat this? Is it healthy? Is this high? Is this low? Uh, what's going to happen uh, if I do eat that? So the thoughts are 24-7. They're really becoming a total preoccupation. Number two are the rituals or the compulsions, the behaviors that surround uh, orthorexia. We have to examine this food. It has to be perhaps prepared in a certain way, eaten in a certain way. Uh, the packaging has to be um, healthy and we're concerned about all kinds of effects of inappropriate cooking, etc. So, all of the compulsions, all the behaviors associated with those obsessions come into play. And that results in a range of foods that are becoming extremely limited. Not only do individuals avoid them because they fear that they may be allergic to them, even though not medically proven, but they fear because they assume that they may be harmful. And some of this assumption has some, some evidence based to it, but much of it doesn't. But the issue here is that the restriction can get so expansive that you literally run out of foods you can eat. And so what happens is you don't eat. You can't eat. What we see then in individuals trying to maintain their weight because it is, remember, it's not about weight loss here. They increase the number of supplements. And they also lose the ability to eat normal. They can't tell what we call intuitive eating. You can't tell when you're full, when you're hungry. And so it becomes a very mechanical kind of process. Well, what happens to my social life? So often those with orthorexia are very proud of their lifestyle and their ability to control food. There's that sense of satisfaction, but also superiority. 
and a lot of times they are intolerant of other people's food beliefs. But the problem comes when you can only maintain healthy eating habits when you're alone or in control of your own surroundings. So let me just read something for you from, so, from an excerpt. I opted out of so many celebrations and social gatherings in fear of the food that I'd be expected to eat or the cocktails I'd be expected to drink. I missed out on friends' birthdays and fun nights and on rare occasions when I would show up, uh, my obvious discomfort and my transparent lies about having already eaten or just wanting water made everyone else feel uncomfortable too. Friends and dates gradually drifted away, preferring the company of somebody who could share a beer after work or go for tacos and margaritas without obsessing over the unhealthiness of what I was eating or drinking. So what we see here is that social isolation, just so that you can adhere to your special diet. So what happens to relationships? Well, of course, conflict with family and friends who don't agree. Excerpts again. My family walked on eggshells around me, buying separate special groceries from the health food store when I was home and watching me agonize over the holiday meals. I lived in a prison that orthorexy had built around me, isolated in a life devoid of joy and connection with others. And families and friends begin to say, hey, what's more important, me or your diet? And then when confronted with this, oftentimes, both parties become very frustrated. And there are moral judgments of each other. And so in our little cartoon here, you are the product of a wildly imbalanced society, and that is why you don't understand. I have finally achieved balance, and now you want to throw me off. Another sign to look for is what happens to my body. Now, as we discussed before, weight loss may not be the primary goal, but as the pleasure of eating disappears and restrictions increase, your weight may actually begin to drop. That initial well-being that you started when you started your healthy eating seems to be disappearing. As a matter of fact, you begin to actually feel worse. Now, it may be related to the restriction of vitamins and minerals in addition to proteins, fat, carbs that have possibly left you with nutritional deficiencies. But experiencing symptoms like low energy, low blood pressure, thinning hair, anemia, muscle weakness, distress fractures, or osteo beginning of osteoporosis, lowered resistance to infection may be popping up on your screen. Be aware of these. In addition, emotional symptoms begin to arise. So another sign is, what happens to my thinking? Well, what initially was a choice to focus on food and health now becomes a compulsion. It's something you must do. You cannot relax the rules. And you may even understand how rigid those rules are. But it's very, very difficult without increasing anxiety to relax those rules. And tension builds up to the point that you just comply, even if you don't want to. And so you begin, again, to exclude certain foods because that makes you feel more comfortable. So what happens with the thinking? Well, the issue is you cannot stop the thoughts. They keep coming. It's difficult to concentrate and focus on anything else. Food is no longer pleasurable. Fear spreads. I think a little image here about the pumpkin spice latte. You know, think before you drink. Uh, absolutely, you know, is this made with how much sugar and what kind of artificial flavors and what kind of preservatives and is there pesticides and... Uh, what, uh, what's the caramel color level on it? So the fear is spreading into every little corner. And there's that all or none thinking. There's no moderation. Food is either good or bad, healthy or unhealthy, pure or impure. And the catastrophic thinking that accompanies it is something terrible is going to happen if I allow myself to do this. And at times, you can recognize that these thoughts are irrational, and at times, you can't. 
as we talked about before, what we see is there's an escalation of this kind of thinking and behavior. Some of the thinking processes of reducing meat is good, eliminating it is better. If eating five veggies a day is good, 10 is better. If a one hour of high intensity exercise is good, two is better. If eliminating one type of food is good, eliminating the whole food group is better. And what we see is that stricter diet is needed to get the same effect. And eventually, what's left to eat? Now, some people can recognize that, oh, oh, I'm in trouble here. This isn't working for me. Okay. And this is a good sign. It's called insight. But there are individuals that get so deeply involved in this that denial sets in, that that persistent belief that those dietary practices are health promoting despite even evidence of malnutrition. And it's very difficult, I think, to break some of this denial in our society with so many people who are supportive of this type of eating. What happens, of course, is that most of us can't hold on to those rigid dietary rules. And there comes a point where we break those rules. And that, again, is one of the signs that such emotional turmoil occurs at that point. The shame, the guilt, the anxiety, the sense of failure, that judgmental part, you or you become your own worst enemy and so critical. But it's that feeling of loss of control and loss of self-esteem and that you've worked so hard to attain all this and now just because you broke that dietary rule, you've lost it all. And physically, when you cheat or go off your diet, Actually, many people report that they feel sick. They have headaches, nausea, fatigue, diarrhea, stomach pain, fuzzy thinking. And all of this is probably related to the fact that when you have been dieting, there have been changes in your gut bacteria and the levels of your digestive enzymes. When you reintroduce these foods, you will see that you get a reaction. Now, the good news is that if you reintroduce them slowly, you probably will end up being okay. But there's a second part that happens. And when you experience that sick feeling, of course, it reinforces the very thinking that we're concerned about, that these foods are dangerous for me and I should be avoiding them. So the tip here is to reintroduce these foods very slowly so that your body can accommodate of course, the other thing that happens when we quote-unquote cheat, we have that emotional reaction that we failed, we were guilty. Um, and so oftentimes what will happen, especially for those who develop orthorexia and are driven to perfection, they will try harder. And so they'll reach out for additional solutions. And if they can't avoid the food, then they will go into cleanses and supplements and herbal remedies and probiotics and even compulsive exercise. So again, that's a sign again, that what you see is this drive toward perfection, this drive to eliminate in any way that you possibly can anything that is going to impair what you perceive as healthy. I think what's interesting though is individuals who go on this diet really initially feel this energy, this sense of clarity, a sense of well-being. I have the key to health that practically no one else knows. I have found balance in my life. Why would I ever want to give this up? And so these diets are able in some way really to promote some healthy initial responses. But the tremendous effort and control that it takes to ma maintain this regime is often utterly amazing. It's hard, but I'm doing it. My question is, aren't you sick of working so hard to control everything? 
Can you see how thin and malnourished you've become? Yes, but you don't know my body like I do. These foods are very dangerous for me. I don't want to fear disease or impurity, and I can just feel my body filling up with those toxins. And then, if you transitioned over to orthorexia, you're faced with some options. Number one, you can continue the escalation, restrict even more, become more trapped, more malnourished, and yes, you might even die. Number two, you can keep cycling between cheating and cleansings. Or number three, you can recognize that there's a problem and decide that you want to change and stop. So the significant sign, what has happened to my life? Food has become the primary source of self-worth, happiness, and meaning. And no matter how hard I try to do the right thing, to eat perfectly, healthy, it is never good enough. Food is taking up all my time, all my energy, my life. And what has started as a way to become healthy and pure has become something that is unhealthy and even dangerous. So maybe a good sign is the decision to get some help. And hopefully you're going to do this before you reach a point you will recognize these symptoms are serious and life-threatening. And once you recognize and accept that there is a problem, you've actually taken your first step toward recovery. So now is the time to take back your life. And I want you to remember, recovery is possible. If you have a story to share with us, please contact us. We'd love to hear from you. Or if you have comments or concern, please contact us also on our blog or actually in person. If you are interested in learning some recovery tips, go to part two of this presentation. And if you are a professional, check out Annette's professional education on our website for further information regarding orthorexia. So thank you. And remember, your future is worth fighting for. So please join us in our fight against eating disorders.